everybody, Craig Lieberman coming back to you with another story this week. This one is for the people who have not been following me for the last five years, because if you've been following me since the beginning of my channel back five years ago, you know that I already did a video about this car. So why am I doing this again? Because now my channel has 212,000 followers and many of them have just never scrolled down through all of my episodes. I can tell this because a lot of people are asking me the same questions that have been answered in my Instagram and on the video on this car that I did five years ago. Also, there have been many, many updates about what happened to the other supers that were used in the first movie, the stunt cars and the buck cars and all that kind of stuff. And over the years, some of the stunt cars have now resurfaced at auctions. Many of these cars were missing. They were just scattered around all over the place and there was just no database in all the cars. But we'll get into this right after this message from my sponsor. Have you ever Googled your name? If you have, you were probably shocked to see some of your personal information floating around for the whole world to see. Every once in a while, I Google myself just for fun. I'm always surprised what kind of things are floating around the internet. It's just creepy that these companies have this information on me. So this is what they do. These data brokers are making money hand over fist by selling your info to robocallers, spammers, and in some cases, much worse. This is why I'm talking about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers who are exposing your information and then submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do that. So let Aura handle all of it for you. Now you can get off of all of those lists. You can try Aura free for two weeks using my link here below, aura.com slash Craig. Aura does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats that you can't even see. It's really easy to set up so you don't have to bother downloading several different apps just to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft, insurance, and even more. You get everything at one affordable price. So let Aura do all the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. I guess I first fell in love with the Super back in 1985. I was still in school and just couldn't afford it. Years later, after going through many different cars, I found myself in a 1993 Mustang GT. It had a 347 stroker with a Vortec S trim, cog driven supercharged setup, fuel system and all that kind of stuff. It was pretty fast. It made about 500 horsepower on a good day. One day though, I'm driving on the toll road here in South Orange County. A Mark IV pulled up next to me on a stretch of the toll road and we did a little pull. We didn't get crazy, but it was just a quick pull. The Supra easily pulled six lengths on me and I said to myself, you know, maybe it's time for me to start reconsidering this Supra thing. So I started looking for Supra of my own, but, but this was in 1997. At that time, the internet was not very big, so it was hard to find cars on the internet for sale. So one day I'm driving my company car and I was in this neighborhood where there, there's like a Latino dealership and I saw this white Supra on a ramp sitting in front of the dealership and it had a big yellow sticker on it that said, sale $24,990. $95. And so I pulled over my company car. I walked into the guy. The guy was really nice. He took it down off the ramp. I looked under the hood. I looked inside the car and I said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll pay you $24,000 today, cashier's check. And he looked at me like, yeah, this gringo is full of <laughs> so I went to my branch of my bank, which was about a couple miles away. And since it wasn't my personal branch, they had to call my personal branch to okay the cashier check. And I drove it over to it and he did the paperwork. And I told him I'd be back uh, that night to get the paperwork ready. And I did. I left my company car at the dealership and we had to go back and pick it later. So on the drive home, which was about an hour and a half, I was having ideas. What should I do for this car? Well, I know what kind of wing I want for it. I know what kind of body kit I want for it. I was looking at uh, two paint colors. I was actually three. Candy apple red, candy yellow, or the Lamborghini 1998 Diablo Roadster color. It was a candy blue. One of those colors would be picked. And just three days after getting it home, went straight to Gretti to get an intercooler, an exhaust system, a downpipe, cam gears, a Gretti air intake, bigger injectors, and Gretti blow-off valve. After that, the car had some kind of stem seal issues. A mechanic friend 
at a shop. I had a fresh head with new hardware, so I went that route. My Freddy JC put it on for me. The same shop that provided with parts, Powerhouse Racing, provided a ported and polished intake plan. And so that was the beginning of the a modification. I, I wasn't going to add bigger turbos on it or big single yet. In this trend, the car made 424 horsepower at the wheels. And that was fine for a driver and a, and a weak and fun car. I wasn't drag racing. I was doing some motocross and all that kind of stuff. But after the Gretti treatment, the car went to the paint shop. At this time, I had chosen a yellow from the Mazda RX-7, which was called Competition Yellow Mica. I had them fit a still-ends urethane front bumper and side skirts, which bonded to the rocker pounders without screws. I did the Rod Millen carbon fiber wing, which was a copy of the TRD wing, and I thought the car is perfect. Dylan also added big brakes, a Clutch Masters 10-ply flywheel and clutch was fitted. The stock chrome wheels were ditched in favor of 18-inch OZ Mita wheels with Yokohama ABS tires, a 285, 30, and 18 in the back. Most of the cosmetics were done by that time. I bought prototype their sway bars on my cars and added stiffer springs. They put a pro kit on it. We put uh, different shocks on it. I can't remember what it was. I think it was Bilstein. It had to be. Next, the car went to audio options where I had them build me an audio video system. Dwayne Ueda and his team went to work. I came to them with the sketch, but the guys over there kind of reworked it and made it even better. So that took about a month. And so now it was basically a street and show car. And right after it was done, like literally two weeks later, I took it to the Meguiar's contest. They had a uh, import car of the year contest and the super got first place i was shocked mcguire's hottest import of the year i should have saved that trophy but i moved twice since then so what can you do well, i drove it around for about two years and then i'm at a car show in manhattan beach with a bunch of other art and motion players and we're sitting there hanging out and this older gentleman walks up to me when i say older he was probably the age i am now back then <laughs> So I feel old. Anyway, he had a Hawaiian shirt. He was a very pleasant guy. And he was asking me generic questions. I just thought he was there with his family. And he talked to me not just about the Supra and other cars. And he came back to the Supra and I showed him all this stuff under the hood. Why do you need this? Why do you need that? Why do you have this oxygen tanks in the back? Which I told him about nitrous oxide. And the guy was just fascinated. And then he just kind of put his hands behind his back and he just walked away. And I was like, Okay, that was a little weird. <laughs> you, sometimes in life you meet people who are a little uh, socially awkward. And after getting to know this guy, I knew that he wasn't socially awkward. He was keep playing his hands close to his chest. About a week later, I'm sitting at my desk. At the time I was working for Naira, do you remember that? I'm trying to get on the Naira circuit. You heard about that? Oh, hell yeah. Naira was the National Import Racing Association. I was the executive director for the whole series, which was owned by Super Street Magazine, which was owned by Peterson Publishing, which owns Hot Rod, Car Craft, and all these other magazines. I had an office on the eighth floor, and I get a phone call from this gentleman. He says, hi, uh, my name is David Martyr, and I saw an ad for this uh, racing thing called Naira. Do you know anything about that? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm the director. How can I help you? He says, well, we're working on a movie, and I was wondering if I could come talk to you for a little while. I said, sure. So we set up an appointment. It came up a couple days later, walked into my office, I sat down and I recognized him immediately. He was wearing another Hawaiian shirt <laughs> and he has this little briefcase. He opens it. He's got paperwork in there and he pulls out this magazine. It's a copy of Turbo Magazine. It has a feature of my Supra in that issue. So we started talking. We're making this movie. It's called Redline. It's all about import tuner cars. We're looking for people who know something about this, this the culture, the genre and what goes on here here and the, who are the players and all that kind of stuff. And I said, yeah, I can help you. He says, why don't we go to lunch? So we go to Delmonico's, put in an order. He opens a briefcase, puts the script on the table, puts a $100 bill on it. Here, this is for you. And I said, what's that for? Well, the $100 is for your time and the script for you is to take a look at it. And I said, all right, I, I, I got to get back to you because I'm leaving this weekend to go to a Naira race and I won't be back until Tuesday. So that's fine. We can get back out of that. So anyway, once I got back, I called him up. He asked me to come down to Universal and have an appointment with some people. And I said, uh, sure. When do you want to do it? Well, do you have your car this week? I said, yes, I'll have it. Okay, why don't you drive it over? I'll give you a gate pass and go to this side gate. And so I pull up into this line of cars that's trying to get in the side gate from the Lancashire side, I think it was. I see this big dude working as security. He's like, a, he looked like he could be a football player when he was younger, but he he had one of those faces like, he looks like he could be really, really mean. <laughs> the guy just looked like he was very serious. So I pull up and he gets on the phone. Here's my name, Craig Lieberman. He turns his back, picks up the phone and he says, he's here, click. 
No, he didn't say anything. And then he said, okay, go over there, just pull over there, follow that little cart, and don't move from where he tells you to go. So now I think I'm in trouble, like I came to the wrong gate. Anyway, I pull it over, stop. This is the other guy gets out of this little golf cart with a little siren. He puts these uh, velvet ropes around this particular area because it's right next to the, what do you call it, the commissary, the place where everybody has lunch. That's the restaurant on the back lot. And so what, they didn't want anybody being near the car. So she said, just stay right here. Somebody will be down here in a minute. And so I'm sitting there for like 15 minutes. It's hot. I'm sitting in the car with the target top off the car and I'm baking there because I'm sitting right in the sun. And then I turn around and I look and see a whole bunch of people coming down. I didn't know any of these people, not one of them. It was Rob Cohen, the director, Neil Moritz, the producer. Uh, there was Paul Walker, there was Vin Diesel, Creighton Ballinger, script writer, a bunch of other names. I don't want to name drop, but important people who are working on this production already. So they had a bunch of questions with me. People are looking under the hood, they're looking in the car, they're looking in the trunk and all that kind of stuff. And this was being filmed, part of that footage wound up in the making of Redliner, making of the Fast and Furious. Rob was really psyched, he was like hit in the candy store. At one point he said, take me here for a ride in your little jalopy. I said, okay, let's go. So I pull out of the gate, I get over to the freeway, the 101 going north. It's about two o'clock in the afternoon, no traffic at that particular time. I kind of get on second gear, third gear, and then just laid into it and the boost comes up. T -t 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 -t. Rob is laughing hilariously. He looks at me, is that the NOS? I said, no, that's the turbo. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we turned around, we came back to the lot and we started having a discussion. They took me upstairs, David Martyr was there. He said, we're gonna hire you as a technical advisor. You can show us the ropes, what kind of cars we should use, what kind of parts we should use, where can we find other cars like this, how we're gonna be building copies of my car. And I said, no offense guys, how much time do you have? What we're gonna build this within a month. Guys, my car was in the paint shop for a month. We have mechanics, we can do all that. And I'm looking at them like they're crazy, but they were not crazy. They were working with the fellow named Eddie Paul. Eddie Paul was the genius who was running the picture car warehouse over in El Segundo. He managed most of the mechanics who were doing all the installations and fabrications on these cars and they had to turn out these cars every day. They were fantastic at doing this. So basically my job was to find companies that would help us with the parts given to us free for sticker placement or discounts and all that kind of stuff. We had to start looking for cars but at that time Supras were not costing $70,000. As a matter of fact, you're gonna be freaking out when I go through these prices. I also told them that the car had some engine modifications, so if they're gonna do that, that's gonna take a lot more time. And basically my car was only BPU, bolt-ons, performance upgrades, you know, uh, you turn up the boost, injectors, and all that kind of stuff. So it's not really a big deal. It did have a nitrous system, but they told me that they're not gonna replicate any of that because they're never gonna see the engine. So all we have to do is do cosmetic replica of the car. But they wanted to change some stuff. They wanted more aggressive aerodynamics, more ricey they used to say. They wanted big mouth bumpers, big giant wings, vents, strakes, gills, fins all over the car. So then I had to start looking for ricey body kits and all that kind of stuff. We came up with the Bomex kit and the APR wing and that that was fine. Bomex was willing to work with us and we got enough extra body kits that we can fix them if they got broken or replace them if they got totaled and that was fine. Now I wasn't really a fan of some of the parts that they put on the cars. I didn't like the wheels that they were putting on the car but we were bringing in parts in a very small warehouse and the guys were ripping the stock stuff off, putting it in a pile and putting the new stuff on, rushing it through the paint. They scuff and buff and they just do clear blended into the color coat. And that was it. In three days, each car was done. All the paint's done, all the body kit stuff on and all kind of stuff. And they started putting stuff in the interiors, fake racing seats or loner seats. They tinted the windows really dark so you can't see that there's some of the stuff that's in my car that's not in the stunt cars or the backup cars. And that's the way they did it. Because from 25 feet away, you're not going to see the details on the inside. In fact, we were so poor because the budget was only 25 million originally and there was just, just no money. So to put gauges on the A-pillar, right, they didn't have the money to buy it. So what they did, they put them in a Xerox machine, Xerox the face of the gauge, and they cut the piece of paper out and used injected molded A-pillar and they just glue it to it. And nobody noticed because there were not enough close-up shots of the car that you could take a minute to see that it was, it was all fake. Anyway, they did it very fast and it was unbelievable. But like I said, the car had quite a few modifications, engine stuff, suspension, wheels, tires, all that kind of stuff, body kit, audio, video, all that. The text that you're seeing right now is the full list of everything that was on the car when uh, Universal had the car. It, or this text, which is the final assembly, because when I got the car back, a lot of things changed again. I put a big turbo on it and that's the basically the way I had it for the, the rest of my time with the car. 
for every car that we decided on, I'm like I'm sitting in this office with Rob and Neil, and I'm going on the, the whiteboard and I'm saying, these are the cars you should be using. R34 GTR, R33 GTR, Acura NSX, Z32, Nissan Z, FD3S, RX7, Toyota Supra, S14s, S15s, Integras, Civics, basically two-door cars, front-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive from Japan. Everybody knows what those cars are. And so this is where it got complicated because all of these cars were going to be rented from private owners. This was groundbreaking because if you know how movies are done, when they need cars, they don't rent it from people. They go out and buy the car. Usually it's some piece of junk. You buy an old Pontiac GTO from a junkyard. You put a paint job on it, fix all the body work, put nice wheels on it, and then you wreck that car because you paid $500 for the car. Some of these cars were at $40,000 in these cars, literally $40,000. And so some of those parts took a year to get from Japan or Germany. The production team was thinking that they could just go down the store and pick it off a shelf. And I had to tell them that's not the way. We had to find parts that, that were on the shelves right now. We couldn't wait to import them. It was not in the cards. So this was very limiting to me because when I'm trying to get party parts for these cars and everything else, we have to buy only what's in stock. And it was the same thing for the Supra. That was a challenge. All those cars would probably be different if they had more time and more money to do this this project, but that wasn't the case. Either way, it worked out. Painting those cars was not fun. There's no way they could do wraps because a wrap wasn't even a thing at that time. So they really had to sand them all down and paint every one of those cars. And when my car came back from the paint shop, they let me have my car painted at my shop. So my car was originally white. I have a picture here with my car in my body shop getting painted orange the proper way. So that was the only car that had the real proper paint job on the car. But I'm gonna tell you this, there was one day I came out at a picture car warehouse and all the supers were lined up uh, out in the parking lot. And seriously, from 25 feet away, I couldn't tell the difference between my car and the cars that they had built in three days each. That was very humbling, <laughs> but they pulled it up. These guys making a production is like a military operation. It's unbelievable. After all the discussions, we realized we needed a total of eight Supras to do everything we needed to do. My car, again, was designated the Hero One, sometimes uh, referred to Brian's Prince this car is used for the glamour shots when they pull up close or drive away close or there's something detail on the exterior of the vehicle or sometimes even in the interior. The Hero 2 was a white naturally aspirated Supra that we paid $18,000 to get it. This was the backup car for my car. So if my car gets scratched and they need a very clean Hero car but when my car was scratched up they would wheel that car in. Given all the jumps it would have to be at least three, and that was the very, very minimum. Again, we were working on a very small budget. The movie's budget was initially only $25 million, but after the producers saw a thrown together teaser using dailies, they upped the budget to $39 million. So that's how it got bumped up. Otherwise, we would be screwed because back in those days, a movie like When Sally Met Harry, or When Harry Met Sally or something, that was a $40 million budget. Looking for the cars was fun because like I said, internet was not very good. We found our first stunt car in Pennsylvania. It was a white 1994 twin turbo car that we scooped up for $11,774. <laughs> Our second stunt car was a black 1994 turbo car that came from Arizona. This one came from the Superstore and this one cost us $24,000. That was the, the, the most we paid for one of those twin turbo Supers. The third car was a 1993 blue naturally aspirated car and this one cost us $19,000 and it was a sad to tear this up because this car was in mint condition. We also had a buck car. This Supra was a 96 twin turbo car that cost us only $10,000. Of course, it was an automatic, but there you go. There was also a silver Supra that we used on a gimbal on a soundstage to film it against a blue screen to capture that nighttime chase with Brian and Mia driving down the desert road. Remember that? We rented that car for $4,000. For the Mick rig, the donor car was a black turbo that had already been stripped, and we got this car for free. So if you wanted to do that again today, we have eight Supras in this movie, it would cost you a half a million dollars. The junk car that you saw that was on the tow truck is not listed on my VIN list, so that car is unaccounted for. Rumors suggest that someone actually had turned that car into a race car or it was a race car, and then it, the Hulk was what was left of the car. Never got clarification in that. So that's how we got the cars. 
And then it was, it was time to do the movie, and so the movie went off, and it made history. So, where are these cars now? Good question, and this is why I'm doing this video. <laughs> uh, we'll start with my car. My car was sold to a buyer in Belgium in 2002. Not long after that, it was sold to another collector in the Netherlands. That car is still there. In fact, in October of 2022, the Chrome Car Guys invited me to a show in Rotterdam, which is in the Netherlands, and I got to see my old Supra in the flesh for the first time in 21 years. It was under a car cover, they pulled the car cover over, and I re immediately recognized the car, but for the signatures in the wing, and that was it. I got inside the car. I'm not gonna lie, it was a pretty emotional moment for me, and it was a great thing to see it again, at least once more before I die, right? <laughs> But it was a very emotional reunion. So that was good to be reunited right with the car. That was great. And then in May of 2023, I saw the car again in Belgium at another car show. And I also went to the Netherlands where the cars are stored and I got to see the current owner's collection. He has several movie cars, or seven or eight. That was great to see. I'll we'll get back to that in a minute. Stunt 3, VIN number 4581, was used in Too Fast, Too Furious as the jump car. So we just take all the storage stuff up and put a new body kit and paint it gold and it was ready to go. This car is now owned by the same guy who bought my Hero 1 Supra and so both these Supras are in the Netherlands in my friend's garage right now. So the third one of the cars from the first movie was, was one of the stunt Supras which sold at auction for $185,000 back in, in 2015. No news about that car since that time. I don't know where it is today. The fourth one, VIN number 9031, which was stunt one from the first movie was reused for Too Fast Too Furious as a second unit car and was used for the flame car too. This is the car that was restored to the first movie look and was sold in 2021 at the Barrett Jackson auction in Phoenix for $550,000. The car is now reportedly owned by a collector in Connecticut or New York. He hasn't made it public, but I know it was being stored in somewhere in New York or Connecticut. That's another one. The fifth car of the first franchise, VIN number, last four digits, 4642. This was stunt number two for the first movie and was reused for Too Fast, Too Furious as the hero number two car. That car is in pretty good shape. So the sixth car, this car had the VIN number 1942. It was the Buck Supra from the first movie, which was reused in the second movie and it was cut into pieces and it became the Mick Rig Supra for Too Fast to Furious, the Slapjack Too Fast to Furious Mick Rig car. Today, this car is still a shell and is owned by a car museum in the Midwest of the United States. No word if that car will ever be restored because <laughs> <laughs> Literally a shell. I don't even know if the car has a dash. So we know where six of the cars are as of 2023. Those are the cars that would be valuable. I don't know about the junk one, but one more thing I'd like to add. One of the most asked questions I get is why did you sell the car? Many reasons. I've talked about this many times, but for you who haven't heard it, here's why. First off, at the time, I already had an R34 GTR Skyline sitting in my driveway. That car became the Too Fast, Too Furious Hero car. I had the Maxima still. I just got back from Universal from the first movie. I had a Lexus GS4 in the driveway. I had a Lexus IS300 for my daily driver. There was just too many cars and there was just not enough room. Secondly, I hated the movie graphics. I hated the wing and I wanted to make many other changes. The wheels, the seats, and many other things. So you can't really do that with the movie car because if you do, you could kind of ruin the collectability. So I also intended to paint the car blue and do a big single turbo which I did and I wanted to change the seats and wheels right after that but by that time I was getting antsy to just keep, make room in the garage on the call out. Further I was already in my 30s at that time and driving a boy racer with a big shopping cart ring seemed silly little kids were mocking me. Let us not forget too, for the first five years after the movie came out, car people made fun of the movie because of the ricey mods. And I remember going to a car show, but not an official car, just so like a cars and coffee thing. And people were looking at me like I was a dork, like some geek or something like that. Nobody liked the graphics on those cars. I'm talking about educated car people, not 16 year old kids who were putting fart can mufflers on their Acura. And lastly, driving a movie car on the street is insanity. It's an irreplaceable car, a hero one movie car on the street is insanity. One mishap and a piece of history is gone forever.
Do you remember that crash with the kid in uh, Colorado and somebody got hit by a drunk driver or something like that? The next morning I woke up to about 500 messages. Your car got crashed? The steering wheel was on the bloody wrong side of the car. It wasn't even an American car. But it reminds everybody, if you're driving one of those cars, anything can happen at any time and then it's gone forever. So basically it was a doorstop. All, what are you gonna do, put it in a museum? I don't own a museum, I'm not, I don't wanna build a museum. That's Gabriel's job. So it was worthless to me. It was $150,000 sitting in your garage floor that you can do nothing with it. And so I took the money and I left. So while I had my fun, I was grateful for everything that came my way, meeting with so many people who were still fans of the franchise. And I'm glad to see that younger kids are getting into the franchise because it changed a lot of lives, not just mine, many other people. And most of the people who own those cars, it changed their lives as well. So it's, it's been positive and it's been a big, great ride. So thanks for watching everybody. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and check out my merch stores. We'll see you next time.